Davis steps under center. Gibson and McClendon behind it. Davis with motion by Richard. Will get the ball to McClendon. He leaps. Oh, he doesn't get in. He fumbled the football. Carolina holds. The game is over. And Carolina has won the game. Finley to throw. Over the middle. Intercepted. Wolfuck again. Wolfuck the other way. At the 30. The 40. Wolfuck to midfield. Miles Wolfuck with the pick. The heels on the doorstep of an enormous victory. Left side of the line. Hood standing to Williams is right. Williams gonna throw. One on one. Davis has it. Touchdown. Carolina wins. Carolina is the Coastal Division champion. Bernard fields it at the 26. Heading to the far side. Gio at the 35. Gio, he's at the 50. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Gio is gonna take it for a touchdown. for the possible win. Snap, spot, kick away, high enough, long enough. It's good! It's good! Carolina has won the game on a 42-yard field goal by freshman Connor Barth. Good gosh, dirty. This is the Heel Tough Blog Hey guys, and welcome in to this edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. And that's right, we're on video for the first time since, well, last August out at Moo and Brew in Charlotte. We did that game, or we did that before the South Carolina game. And now uh, we are probably going to be going to video podcast here. Uh, we're still going to be on, on Spreaker. We're still going to be uh, uploading through there. You'll still be able to find the podcast on all your favorite podcasting sites. We'll just take the audio that we do from this and put it in there. But uh, a lot of the shows going forward uh, will be through video. There's going to be some cool things that we're going to be able to do uh, for you guys. So uh, we figured we'd take it to video mode um, going forward, uh, especially here as we get ready to begin uh, what is an unorthodox but still very exciting 2020 season. Uh, I think I speak for both of us when I say we are very excited uh, about the possibility of uh, this Tar Heel team being very good this year. There's a reason that they're ranked inside the top 25 in the AP poll, ranked inside actually the top 20. Um, and with, you know, nothing's potentially breaking right, uh, this Carolina team could find themselves in college football playoff contention this season in a year that is pretty much unlike any other. Yeah, I think you hit it all right there. Excited about the move to video so y'all can now see our faces while we talk. And well, we're not you. excited about that part for you. I am. This might help me get We a have girlfriend. radio faces. We've addressed this before many times on the actual, on, on, on the audio version of the podcast, that we are not... No, we're not great television faces. Let's just be brutally. I can now here. tell my parents so I'm putting myself out there and trying to get a woman. So, I guess you know this, this is our this way is of how, video dating, ladies. Yes. It's How's worked it better than any other account. But no, you're right. A lot of <laughs> a lot of excitement and a lot of expectations in only year two of Mac Brown. I, I think you know when he came back, we wanted to temper when we'd get to this part of the expectations. But you win seven games, you got a quarterback like Sam Howell. It, it's a reason why we're sitting in year two. And like you said, this team, if, if they if enough things go right, they could be in the in the college football playoff discussion when we get that first ranking November 17th. Well, hey, we're going to go through this team, kind of break it down for you here over the next two weeks. Of course, we'll start today on the offensive side of the ball. And look, this team last year, a much different team the first game of the year than the team that we saw at the end of the year. Um, you know, I was reading, you know, some of the offseason stuff for some of these big time, uh, uh, you know, articles and, and, and uh, outlets uh, out there. And a lot of people really look at the end of the schedule, say Mercer, NC State, Temple, really not great opponents that you're going up against. I think people forget that you know the game against the game against Mercer makes sense. The game against NC State was two teams that were trying to make a bowl game. Carolina needed that to be able to get into a bowl game. 
Uh, so there, and and that's a rivalry that has been dominated by NC State in recent years. Even right. though that NC State team wasn't that good, uh, to me, especially to be down as they were at halftime, come back with that second half performance and take over and win that game by thirty one was something else. And then Temple, that was a team that coming in was eight and four. They had some pretty good defensive numbers. That was not a team as you would expect they could with rush any Temple. Pasture, which was our weakness at that time. Right. Yeah. Quincy Roche, who's a guy that they're talking about at Miami, could be one of the best pass rushers in the country, was on that roster and played in that bowl game. Right. So let's not act like this was a team that was a pushover. But you know, you look at the overall stats from last year. Uh, you know, as a you know total offense, four hundred and seventy four point zero yards of total offense. Uh, rushed for one hundred and eighty eight point two yards on the ground. Pretty good numbers for them after you know the the previous few years they had struggled rushing the football. Surprisingly, in two thousand eighteen they ran the ball well. But that was one of the things towards the end of Larry. Fedora's time in Chapel Hill. Uh, the Tar Heels really struggled to be able to run the football well. And of course, uh, 285.8 yards per game through the air. Uh, and that's, I think, the area that we got to begin with. And we'll start with that quarterback group. You talk about Sam Howell, you know, coming off a historic freshman season. Uh, now, you know, looking to see what he can do in year two here in Chapel Hill. And I mean, you, you look at the statistics from him a year ago uh, 3,641 yards yards, 38 touchdowns, which was not only a new program record, also a true freshman record for uh, the NCAA, and only through seven interceptions. So he took care of the football, still made big plays, and I think the thing that we saw as the year went along, you know, we saw him early on in the season be faced with some really tough late game situations. There's still people saying that they want to see him get a little bit better in those late game situations. I think... For a true freshman, he looked pretty good. I think you're going to see, you know, even more maturity, really, not only from him, but the guys around him in those scenarios going forward. But the thing where, I, you know, that I saw from him early on, and I pointed it out to you in the first game of the year, and we saw it sort of elevate as the year went along, was just his ability to throw the ball down the field with, with so much precision accuracy. I mean, this guy is probably the best deep throw of the football that we've seen in Carolina football history, I would say. Yeah, no, not only that's even really a question. Um, he amazed us in a lot of different ways last year that we, we raved about for 12 weeks, 13 weeks, and all offseason. He's the third best quarterback in college football, right behind Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields. And you're not I, gonna, would, I, I would agree with that. And I don't think that. that's really much of an argument. He was the second best deep throw in the, in, in the country last year behind Joe Burrow. And we all know what Joe Burrow and LSU did last year on the way to their national championship. Right. He's legitimate. And he did all of this last year with a new offensive coordinator, a bunch of guys that we knew had a lot of talent, but outside of Daz Newsom had never really produced to that kind of level. And how long did we thought he was being held back by Phil Longo in the offense? The first four weeks, they were wanting to run the ball more, and then they finally turned the, the offense over to let him throw the ball. That's when you saw that offense from that Georgia Tech game on really do whatever they wanted to do you know, in the, in the ACC. Right. So... Um, He's got a lot of pressure on him, but he never seemed, you know, phased last year. He's always poised and stoic in the pocket, can make the big throws in the big situations. I don't think that'll be a problem again this year. Yeah, I, I don't really get the the notion that he needs to be better in clutch time. I mean, I guess, you know, you look at the fact that all six games were within seven points, maybe may, you know, all six losses. That, But, I mean, at the same time, I, I feel like that was more of, you know, the play calling, there uh, was the guys one game around him. that I thought he looked like a freshman, and that was at Pittsburgh on a Thursday night where he missed a couple throws. And outside of right, that, yes, but yeah, even in that game— right. And the game against Virginia, his defense was beat to hell, and we were still there with a chance to win. Yeah, you should. I mean, that was you, you look that that you can't let up thirty eight points to, to Virginia or Virginia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Either one of those games, you cannot let exactly. up as many points as you let up. Um, especially, I mean, uh, don't even bring me back to that Bryce Perkins run in that game against Virginia. That was just unbelievable. That looked like the old Tar Heel defense. But uh, yeah, no, I I think you know the biggest thing that he's got to avoid is that sophomore slump that we talk about so much with a lot of these guys. But is it just me? I don't, I'm not really that concerned about that for him because I feel like he's probably that type of guy like Trevor Lawrence, like Justin Fields, where maybe early on some teams are going to throw some things at him that he hasn't seen. But I feel like he'll be able to adjust kind of on the fly because he's he's that cerebral. I mean, we've heard all offseason from Mac Brown, from from Coach Longo, uh, you know, even from some of the guys around the team. Sam is in the 
the film room day in, day out. First guy in, last guy out, that old cliche. But, I mean, he's a guy that has not only been studying his own tape, been studying guys like Joe Burrow, been studying some NFL guys' tape during this. I feel like if there's anybody that's built to try to, you know, use everything possible to avoid a sophomore slump, it's Sam Howell. Yeah. I even wrote about this in a, in a way back earlier in the summer, trying to comparing him to great quarterbacks as freshmen, how they translate into their sophomore years. He looks to be on par with the, you know, the Trevor Lawrence's and the Deshaun Watson's where he's not going to take the step back like Johnny Manziel or Jameis Winston. He looks poised to be better. Right. And if he's better, what does that envision for Carolina? And also, I think, I don't see him taking a step back because look how much he's bringing back. And look how much they're adding with this recruiting class. There's still a lot of talent around him. And in the second year in the system, he's going to be more comfortable. And you would think that they're going to be better in the red zone, right? You, I mean, you they got to be. They gotta be. Yeah. I mean, you know, we saw it late last year. Again, that final three-game stretch, they looked better in the red zone. But we've got to see it against better opponents. Yep. That's the one area where I agree with these people that we've got to see it against some of these middle-of-the-ACC opponents. Because this year, you don't have that 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 early start where you can get your feet yeah, below you. You, you weren't going to have that coming out anyways. Exactly. Now you're definitely not going to have it. You're one game that you are looking at and saying probably on the schedule this should for sure be a win. It's Charlotte. Is Charlotte that's still a very good football team. Will Healy is a very good coach. Is a guy that we've talked about multiple times. Is probably right there with Jay Bateman as guys we would want to replace Mac Brown whenever he inevitably retires for the second time and probably wraps up his college football coaching right. career. Um, but I, I mean that's the and then you know when we, we we bring in the fact that we're probably going to see him run the football a little more. I found it interesting during today's press conference. Mac Brown said that Sam has actually lost a little bit of weight. Last year, he was built a little bigger. He was. I think this year, what they're trying to do is try to allow him to run the ball. He does have a, a little bit more speed than maybe some people realize. By dropping a little bit of weight, I think that'll help him sort of become a little more of a factor in that run game. And the other big thing is the guys behind him. But I think that's another aspect that we have to talk about, especially when it comes to that red zone conversation. Yeah, I mean, you know, if he drops weight, yeah, which he has, and even if he doesn't necessarily run five to six times, it, you want him to have the threat to take off and run. Right. Last year, we never he was never a threat. So you could, you know, the defense could kind of shrink the field a little bit. But now if you know that he, he might take off and run, they got to account for that. But, you know, I guess we're wanting to move into how Jace Reuter kind of uh, – plays a role into this. Well, yeah, that's, that's the interesting Brown is part. not shy of having a package for him. He, he said that, and again, we've talked about this. I mentioned this on the last podcast with Zach. I don't think that that is set in stone from what they've been saying since then. Right. I think that's an idea that came in their head. They said to themselves, okay, maybe this isn't a bad idea because there is better mobility here from Jace than there is for... Sam. Right. Sam can run. Sam did it at the high school level. Yeah. This is different, though. And, you know, you don't want to take that risk too often with Sam. You you want to pull it out every so often because, again, that's something that most teams that are scouting that aren't really around the team every day probably won't be looking for because – he didn't. He didn't run a lot last year. Yeah, Everything that we heard from him in preseason last year, he said, "Look, I don't want to use my legs that much because, you know, I don't want. I want to avoid trying to get hurt. I want to be able to stay on the field as much as possible." Because there were times during his high school career where he took shots and had to miss games or miss certain, you know, parts of games before coming back in. And I mean, one that comes to mind for me because I was a local guy around here. He had to come out of a game against Weddington. They ended up losing that game. If he was in the game, they probably win that. Right. Um, so that's, I think, what they're you know they're looking at Reuter and saying. And the good news for him is, is we've heard it you know for the last couple of months, and so far in camp he's looked like it. Jace is healthy, and he is going to be the number two guy. I thought you know originally in the off season. They talked about how Jacoby Criswell fit this offense so well. I mean, his his comparison on 24-7 sports was Sam Howell. Right. He was a guy that fits this offense like a glove. But it feels like Jace has control of that job and now might even be doing enough to potentially get himself a couple reps throughout yeah. the season. And, I mean, you know, I think we they need quarterback depth. So this is a good thing that they're, they're building right. now. They... I'd make the argument, especially when they get Drake May in there, they may have the best quarterback room in, in college football. It's going to be close. I think it, it's definitely going to have an argument, and it's 
I mean, depending on what happens for Clemson, I think you could say they would be yeah. the best in the ACC. It's going to be close, but they're getting there. Yes, for sure. But, you know, you look at with what COVID can bring up, and, you know, we don't want to speculate something, but depth is going to be important at every position across the board. Especially your, your quarterback. Yeah. You have got to have a guy if if – for some reason, Sam has to sit out a game because of COVID, or if he just gets injured. Gets injured, which is possible. This is football. It's, it's football. I mean, last year, Vince Namadola had been our guy taking snaps. Uh, yeah, Carolina Abby wasn't going to win with Vince Namadola. Yeah. You Congra- can win with Jay Schroeder. Congratulations to Vincent, by the way, who was in the transfer portal hoping to find a new destination for him. I guess he, sh- in his mind, showed enough that he's going to be able to go out and maybe potentially find somewhere, you know, at the FCS ranks or maybe even in the FBS ranks to get a job. But yeah, he's off the roster. Now, yeah, you got Jace Reuter, you've got Jacoby Criswell, and again, you feel like there's talent there, but the biggest thing is having these guys ready because at the drop of a hat, Something can you could need these yeah. guys. And it's not, you know, at this position, I mean, that's the other thing. The quarterback room, you know, you hope that it doesn't spread throughout that quarterback room, you know, if, if, if an infection does happen because then you could have to start somebody else entirely. But, I, you know, I, that's the biggest thing is I think, you know, this year especially, getting a guy ready and maybe even having him take some snaps in-game in, a, in you know, a certain package is not a bad thing getting him some in-game reps. And that's the other thing. People freak out when they hear that Carolina is potentially going two quarterbacks. This is not they're going two quarterbacks. They're going to rotate them every other drive. They're trying to find a starter. They think that Jace can bring them something in specific packages. Sam Howell is this team's starter, and I'm telling you, by the time that he leaves, he will be the best quarterback in program history. Yeah, the stats will say it. Yeah. The, the eye test will say it. There is no reason to be concerned that Jace Reuter is challenging him for a starting job. That is not even remotely happening. And Jace knows that. The staff knows that. Sam knows that. My thing is I, if, if this team was to go to two quarterbacks, which they're not, I trust them a hell of a lot more with Mac Brown than Larry Fedora trying to run two and quarterbacks. And Phil Longo, yeah. yes. Yeah. So you gotta, I think that's the thing I look at is this is a different staff, different regime. This wasn't Larry Fedora with we had Trubisky and Marquise Williams. This would just right. be a, a situational type of thing, like we saw with Florida and Tim Tebow and Chris Lick, the other one, the national title, where it was just situations to make their team better at that at that time. And remember, we heard last year, Max said before the season, I've run two quarterbacks before. I, I I wouldn't mind running two quarterbacks here. How quickly did that go yeah. out the window? If it, I mean, if they see that Sam is rolling that good, they feel like it's going to hurt them. They will they will just stick with yeah. Sam. But the good thing is, is that you know around whichever quarterback is going to be out there, most of the time, Sam, you're going to have just an, a, a great group of skill players. It starts in that backfield. Michael Carter, Javante Williams, both coming back. I think you got to start with Michael Carter because it's very interesting that he is the guy that seems to be in most of the national outlets the clear number one running back. When really it's a two guy system, but we've seen him appear on the Doak Walker watch list. We've seen him appear on. On a, uh, a you know pretty high in a lot of the all ACC preseason teams and some of these national magazines, it seems like most people believe that Michael Carter is this team's number one back. But I don't really think it's all that clear. I think it's another year where we're going to see a lot of rotation between. The yeah, two. I think Javante Williams will definitely get his fair share of carries. Had he not been slowed up with injured at the end of last year, he would have been a thousand yard rusher. I think he would have led the team out of the yeah, two of them. So do he I. gets injured in that game against uh, Virginia and then just. That that was that pretty much ruined the rest of the year right. for him. He couldn't get back on track. M- Michael Carter's more flashy. He's got a little bit more speed. Where Javante Williams is just he's a runner. He's going to run you over, and he's going to he's going to get the yards that you know you don't really think about, but they add up over time. He never goes down at first contact, but you know this is what Carolina can once can, can throw the football. I think they want to run the ball at a really high clip this year, and you know they get over two hundred yards a game. Right. And I think that should be the expectation. I think I think they're good enough up front to get a push, but they've got so much talent in that backfield to where they could both average 100 yards a game. And we saw in the games that they won, especially the games that you and I were in person for, South Carolina, Miami, um, Duke, when they were fresher, they were able to just line up and shove the ball down your throat. And, and that's what makes Alabama and Clemson and all those teams so great is that they can throw it, but when they can just line up and run the ball down your throat, 
that you ain't stopping them. And that's what Carolina's trying to get to. When you got Michael Carter and Javante Williams, that makes it a lot easier. Well, you remember last year when Mac Brown said before the season that he wanted our offense to kind of look like Oklahoma's. Yeah. And we kind of had a good chuckle about that. Yeah, we were I like, laugh. that's going to take a yeah. while to get there. It really didn't. And that's exactly what you're talking about, is that not only are you going to throw the ball well, you've got a quarterback that can that can get you anything that you need when you need it. He's a guy that is in the Heisman race in most people's opinions, and I think has a good chance to probably win the Heisman this year. Probably the best chance since I would I would say Charlie Justice just because of the fact that you combine his talent with the fact that you're going to have guys that won't be apparently qualifying for it because I don't believe that they're going to wait until after the spring season to get yeah. it out. I think they're going to give it out after the fall. Um, but, I mean, yeah, that's the thing. You've got a running game that can – kind of get you there as well it can also you know this is the thing that we were always wanting late in games that we were winning under Larry Fedora we would still have to throw the football throw the football throw the football because we couldn't run the ball yeah now we finally got a team that can run the ball well and to me I mean you look at some of the games that they lost last year the biggest one that I go back to is that game against Virginia Tech they pretty much completely abandoned the run just said let's sling it around the yard and find a way to win it and they could they couldn't do it yeah because you've got to be able to be balanced. That's why this. That's how this offense works so successfully. And it shouldn't shock us. I think we kind of overlooked it. When Phil Longo was at Ole Miss, they really did run the ball pretty well with guys like Jordan Wilkins and, and others back there that sort of led to opening up your passing game. Because when you just want to you know, stand back and throw, teams will just drop seven and there you go. Yep. All of a sudden, you're stuck trying to find, you know, find ways to get open. And while we have guys that are really talented had big seasons a year ago at times they they struggled to create separation so you know I I, I think you know if you look at that running backs those running backs like you said though I mean you're, you you got to be very confident especially in those top two guys that we talked about like what you said about Javante really that straight line runner you mix that with Michael Carter who uh, you know look doesn't I mean doesn't run soft but is able to get to the outside yeah. a little more of a technical runner um, this season I'd like to see him sort of add just maybe a little bit more speed so that we can hit more of those home run plays. I felt like there were so many running plays like that a year ago where you felt that they were one tackle away from breaking that long run off and they just could never seem to break off that 60, 70 yard run till the game against Mercer where Antonio Williams barst off a long run. So did Michael Carter. But, um, you know, the good thing is, is, you know, you got those two guys. Now there are questions behind them. Josh Henderson, who we saw a little bit of late in the season in some you know mop up duty, uh, as well as you know guys like uh, true freshman DJ Jones, true freshman Elijah Green, and walk on British Brooks, all battling for reps back there. But I feel like Josh Henderson is probably your guy here. Uh, I still think there are some interesting options behind him, though, especially if the freshmen can grow into their shoes quick. Yeah, and I think. Mac Brown is going to want to have three guys they can count on. You know you got Michael Carter. You know you got Javante Williams. Who fills the Antonio Williams role from last year? Now, granted, with Antonio, his leadership was more felt maybe off the foot in the locker room, but his production on the field really helped Carolina. had 322 yards, and in those games I was talking about where they were wearing down opponents, he was the guy that was wearing down those teams late in the fourth quarter because right. no one wanted to tackle his, his big behind. I think Josh Henderson is going to be that guy. I wrote about that back when we did our breakout players. I think he's going to be a guy that will break out. And I don't know if that means he's going to run for 500 yards or 10 touchdowns. But I think he's going to be right. a productive member of the backfield to give Mac Brown this offense that three-horse true that they're looking for. So Yeah, I mean, you're just looking for a guy that, let's say, that Michael Carter or Javante Williams goes down for a week. Which and is possible. Play. Yeah, we saw it Both last year. Both of them year. have struggled with health. Right. I mean, we we saw it last year. Both guys can get banged up. you got to think that this is a, another season, you know, not only just with, with COVID, but this isn't a season where you weren't able to spend as much time in the weight room as you'd probably like. You might not be as conditioned as you might like as well. Uh, that's one of those areas where Josh Henderson could factor in. I mean, look. Look, last year, 18 carries, 127 yards, yeah. no touchdowns. Now, granted, again, in mop-up duty, 
But still, I mean, that's 7.1 yards per carry. That's, that's not bad. That's something that could help your, your offense this year. And even if it's not him, if one of the other guys steps up and really breaks out, I would think if I'm going to go with one, it'd be Elijah Green. I think he's more of that home run hitter that maybe the Toros are looking for. He's got a little more speed, very experienced at the high school level. I mean, he went uh, to three state title games and won them back-to-back years or back-to-back-to-back years to finish out his high school career. So, I mean, look, he's kind of been there, done that uh, in terms of, you know, making long playoff runs and stuff like that. So in terms of durability, might be your guy as well. That's that's probably the name to keep an eye on there. You go out to the wide receiving group and, man, we talk about, you know, the deepest positions on this team. I think with the guys that have opted out, at defensive back, who we'll talk about next week. I think this is now the deepest position on the team, no doubt. Um, You, of course, bring back Deami Brown, Daz Newsome, Bo Corrales. Uh, that, That trio last year, just fantastic. All three guys over 500 yards over uh, at least six touchdowns receiving. Uh, the top two, Deami Brown and Daz Newsom, both over 1,000, both at least 10 touchdowns. Just a fantastic year from those guys. You know, Deami's your home run hitter. He's been your deep threat. I mean, look, he, he somehow, I think this slipped under the radar, he almost challenged Mac Holland's year back in 2015, 20.3 yards per catch. And we're talking about a guy that caught 51 passes, too. So this guy was the definition of a home run hitter. If you don't know how good of a deep threat he is, just go back and watch that Virginia game. That'll show you right there. Uh, Daz Newsome in the slot was fantastic. Led the team with 72 catches. Uh, Short of, you know, I I thought maybe it was just me. Everything changed for Daz in that Virginia Tech yeah, game. Yeah, that's was, where it all started. Yeah. It, there was a different mindset that he took. Remember that Virginia Tech pretty much took a took a pass on him, said, we don't think he fits what we need. We don't think he's going to be all that great of a slot receiver. There's too many questions on him. Basically allowing him to come to Carolina, he, wanted to, he, he took that personally, wanted to show him, and that was – that was a different guy the rest of the way. And then Bo Corrales, I mean, I, he he really shocked me last season. You know, you got to remember, starting the year, that game against South Carolina, he didn't start that game. Didn't yep. start against Miami either. Nope. Antone Green started both of those games, but he goes down. Bo Corrales ends up having to step up, and Bo became the number three wide receiver on this team and a really good one at that. I mean, arguably, you put him on any other team in the ACC, he's probably a really good number two for anybody. Yeah, I think when you look at this receiving core is they've got all three levels that you're looking for. You've got your home run hitter in Diami Brown. You've got your slot guy with Daz Newsom. You've got your red zone target in Bo Corrales. They've got guys at all three levels they can get the football to, and they're going to be productive. And they just they made life so much easier last year for Sam. I think that's one thing I looked at was that they were catching balls that – Sometimes they wouldn't have caught whenever it was Kate Fortin, whoever was under, you know, throwing the ball to him. They went and made plays. Some of that was Sam was given the opportunity to make plays, but they they just had the ability to go and jump up and make and make some uh, con- contested catches. And it's you know, that's that's as good as a tree you're going to find in the ACC receiving wise. I'm looking at our little rundown here um, that you you typed up for us. We got the Groves and Downs battling for. Uh, reps in the slot. I, I, I do think, you know, you're talking about depth. There, There is some depth there, too. I don't know if I'd still go as far to say it's deeper than the backfield, even though the backfield has got some guys that are sitting out due to COVID, but there is depth in that secondary, or in the wide receiver court. I, I think it's deeper, because, I mean, you look at I mean, just talking about Downs and and, uh, and Groves battling, there was actually news on that today. Pretty much everybody's mindset now is that if Josh Downs isn't your backup in the slot, it'd be a stunner. He's another guy I think will break out, by the I, way. I mean, he's... He's everything that you want in, in a slot receiver. I mean, he showed it in the Under Armour. Uh, no, excuse me, not the Under Armour. The uh, Army All-American game was fantastic. I mean, was just was the hardest wide receiver on that field to stop. Um, I mean, he's a as polished of a route runner as you're going to find. He's quick in short space. I mean, he's he's pretty much da- he's Daz Newsome 2.0 in the in the middle of that offense for you. And you would think that, you know, he's already at a level that Daz probably was last year in terms of where people feel his skill set is. It's only going to grow from there. I mean, he's, yeah, he, he it's going to be hard to keep him off the field. And they, I mean, that's the thing. They said today, you know, he's got to be out there. So pretty much he, you know, Toe Groves could lose reps, not 
at any fault of his own. I it's thought just last Josh year, Downs is that dang good. Right. Last year, I thought, you know, I mean, look, you don't win the game against Miami without Toe Groves. He made the catch on fourth, on fourth down. Yep. If he doesn't make that catch, you lose that game. Who knows what, what your season looks like. So, I mean, it, it, he had so many moments like that. Of course, was big for you in the punt return game as well. Was your guy that fielded the ball pretty much whenever you were inside the 20-yard line. We'll probably handle that role again this year. It's just, you know, there's so much talent in that slot right now that it's it's – it's a battle down there every day. You got to come prepared or else you could lose reps. So, yeah. you know, all these guys, I think, you know, the good news is is you're going to be able to keep all these guys fresh. That was one of the main things that we've heard from Mac Brown throughout everything. And and I think most people really just kind of relay it to the offensive side of the ball. Well, Mac wants us to be deep on the or, or on the defensive side of the ball. Excuse me. Mac just you know, really wants us to be deep on the defensive side of the ball. No, he also wants that on the offensive side. He wants when you take a guy off the field, you're putting a guy out there that's as good and is fresh. And is fresh. Yep. What you know, or at least you know, in that moment is uh, you know, marginally better than the guy that's coming off the field tired. When they're fresh. That's what you're looking for. And I feel like right now, you're getting towards that point. I mean, you talk about a guy on the outside. We talked about Antone Green started two games last year. Biggest thing for him is can he stay healthy? He averaged 27.1 yards per catch last year when, you know, he was somewhat relatively healthy. Middle of the season, he had the injury. Sustained it against Miami. It was a lower leg injury. Never really found out exactly what it was. But that's the second year in a row where he's had, he's had a leg issue. If he can stay healthy, you would feel that he's going to be the depth guy on the outside out, you know, next to Corrales and Diami, and that's going to give you a chance to keep those guys a little bit fresh because, you know, Mac was saying it about a lot of the guys earlier today. There were a lot of guys that probably played a little too much last year. You had to keep them on the field because they were, they were, they were just so much more talented than the backups. You felt like that was a huge drop-off. The goal is to get them to that point. I think Antone Green has the talent. We heard that. There's a reason why he was going to – why he started yeah, the first game last it year. It wasn't a fluke. So, you know, all he's got to do is stay healthy. And then, uh, you know, Steven Gosnell, Tylee Kraft, both guys that are true freshmen, but both guys that have talent, have really shined early on. Tylee Kraft's big, tall on the outside, another guy that can kind of take the top off of the defense. So those are other guys that, again, they're freshmen. You would think that, you know, we're, we're going to see them eventually. You know, maybe they, we don't see them their freshman year, but you never really know. I mean, you don't know who's going to jump up and really surprise you out of this group just like Bo Corrales did last year. I think those are two guys that you could potentially keep an eye on. That that doesn't even mention a guy like Chaffrey Brown, who was a four-star receiver when we got him last year. I mean, we haven't even mentioned him. He's another guy that's there. The depth in this group is just stacked. And you didn't even talk about the one guy that I think I, I mentioned, Josh Jams. I think I think Emory Simmons is going to play a bigger oh, yeah. role. Emory in this Simmons, offense. yep. Um, then he did last year, only four catches, seventy-two yards. I do think he could be your Bo Corrales type. Where I'm not saying in terms of production, but he could probably get to thirty catches and maybe three hundred, four hundred yards and five or six touchdowns. And I think he fits what Bo does. Yeah, outside receiver that will be a red zone threat for you can pretty much catch just about anything you throw his way. His biggest thing is going to be, can he get separation? He was a really good route runner in high school. When we saw him last year, he kind of struggled to separate a little bit, which was expected for a freshman guy. But I think you're right. I mean, see, that's the thing. I went with Anton Green as my breakout guy if he stays healthy. Again, we're, we're talking about there's just not enough room for yeah. all these guys on this one football They all just got to find grass, and then they'll make plays. They are, this offense is built on is finding grass, and they'll make plays. There we go. They, and, you know. The good thing is they got a gun so they can get them football. So they they just, just got to find the grass. Well, look, I mean, they're they're going to probably be, you know, some four and five wide receiver sets this year, mostly because, I mean, you look at that tight end spot, and there's still a lot of question marks there. I mean, Garrett Walston last year, I mean, didn't have a bad year. Definitely had a pretty good year as a run blocker for him on, on, at tight end. But, look, this year... It's up to him. He's got to step up, and they've got to find another guy alongside of him because Jake Vargas, Carl Tucker, gone. So now you've got to find somebody else besides him when you want to be able to run this football. I know that a lot of people are kind of, you know, they're stuck in the thinking that, okay, if we have four wide receiver set and a tight end, we can still run the ball well. They are not going to abandon 
the two tight end sets because yeah. it worked so well last year to yeah. run the ball. Mm-hmm. And I I just think if, if they abandon it, that's just not smart. Why go away from something that worked so well last year? I think they've got to go back to it again. I mean, Walston is your guy. We want to see him take a step forward receiving-wise. I mean, nine catches, 76 yards isn't going to do it. I mean, the fact that Carolina did not have a tight end that caught more than 10 passes or had more than 100 yards receiving it, last year. It's, it's concerning. That's something that has to change. Now, you know, they made the change at tight ends coach. John Lilly's coming in. Maybe that's going to make a difference. We'll just have to kind of wait and see. But you've got the main thing is, is outside of Walston, who's that other guy from the group of three guys that have been battling for that spot in camp? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned they're going to stay in two tight end sets because that's how they were more effective running the football. But I do think they've got to get more production receiving-wise from this position. Mm-hmm. I think that's the one element of this offense that it's missing. You know you can run the ball. You know you can get the ball to your wide receivers. But guess what? We've seen that on tape now. These defensive coordinators have had an extended offseason to prepare Prepare to stop that, and they're going to be able to. What is a quarterback's f- uh, best uh, uh, best dream? They're having that safety valve. Tony Romo, my quarterback, lived on that. NFL quarterbacks, they need that. Sam lived on that in high school. Yeah, he had a guy Luke Burnett, who's who's at App State, who yeah. was really good. He loved. They need, they need that guy that on third and four or third and six, whatever it is, can move the change, keep a drive alive that changes the game, changes the momentum. I think Garrett Walston can do that, but I think you brought up another good point. They've got to get quality guys that can block out there on the edge and then and you get to the next level because last year, you know, that's the thing. We didn't look at that last year, mainly as much as we, as we should have. As, oh, man, that two times sets where we can really run the ball. But, you know, this year, if we can't do it, you're going to miss Carl Tucker's now at Alabama. And Jake Vargas, who couldn't really – wasn't a great receiver threat, but he would he'd put his bite there He was block. the best blocker on the team yeah. last year. I mean, he, he might have been better than some of the O-linemen. He was that good. He was that good on the edge. Sealing the edge. put him in my trench report last year. I mean, sealing the edge, he was just yeah. that good. People – I think people really forgot about him unless you went back and watched – trench film and 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 really focused on the blocking up front you would see that he was a big piece for what they did a year ago and that that's the thing everybody thinks well you know we're just gonna we, if you go to one tight end you know our guys will be fine you're talking about an offensive line that's kind of rebuilding and we'll, we'll we'll transition into that here in, in just a minute fully transition but I mean you're talking about an offensive line that's got to find a new left tackle and Jordan Tucker is in my opinion a better pass protector than he is a run blocker. right so you've got I mean you have got to find somebody that can help you seal that edge and who is that going to be I mean I think the, the the obvious guy would be Kamari Morales he's been in the system for a year you feel like he's probably put on some weight but he was small when he came in he was 235 last year um, and then you talk about guys like John Copenhaver John doesn't really fit that Copenhaver's more of a he's a thinner guy um, sort of your your receiving tight end when we brought him in you know I said this is the guy that probably resembles a receiver the most for Carolina since Eric Ebron was there in terms of a tight end that that thin body style he what I think they were trying to go with when they got him was uh, an Evan Ingram type from Ole Miss I I think that's kind of what they were envisioning with him Kendall Carr is a little bit bigger problem with Kendall he's coming off a torn ACL he missed his whole senior season at Stuart Kramer is he going to be able to come in and immediately take over those reps there I don't really know one of those three has to step up my mind tells me it's Morales. Morales also is a pretty good receiver. He was a good receiver in high school as well in Tallahassee, Florida. But he's, I mean, we've got to see one of these guys step up and, and quickly early in the year. And, I mean, for Garrett Walston, we also need to see him take his game to another level. So, yeah, I feel like those are the biggest things on, on uh, when it comes to the tight ends. And I thought that was the biggest question on the offensive side of the ball. No, no, no doubt. As we're learning more and more, that may not be. This may be the offensive line. Mac Brown said today they have six guys that he feels would be ready to play if needed. He wants to have eight. He said in order to feel really comfortable, he said this a couple of weeks ago, he'd want to have ten. I mean, you're not really near that from what you're telling us today. Just lost Billy Ross. Now, again, Billy was a death piece. But remember, Billy started 
uh, uh, every game back in 2018. Right. So that guy, he has starting experience. You could use him at offense at both offensive guard spots. So that's a bigger loss than probably people realize. You would think right now how it's looking. Okay, you know that Marcus McKeithen's your right guard. I thought he was really, really good last year. I think he's probably the leader of your offensive line this year. Jordan Tucker's your right tackle, which I feel comfortable with him at right tackle. I thought he looked good, you know, in 2018 when he started the final game of the year against NC State. I thought that parlayed over into last year, and I thought he grew as the year went along. You got Joshua Zudu, who, you know, we saw, he started the game at left tackle against App State, struggled. They kicked him inside to left guard. He was fantastic. He he allowed one sack the whole year. Graded out as the best, the second best, excuse me, returning uh, pass blocker in the ACC for this upcoming season. Those guys are locked in. Then you get to the center position. Now, this seemed like it was going to be a battle between Brian Anderson and Ty Murray. Um, some people that I've seen are now saying that Ty Murray hasn't been practicing lately because he's been out with an injury. So now that looks like that's probably going to go to Brian Anderson. Unfortunately, Ty Murray will probably handle that backup role. But I think those reps will be split a little bit this year because Max said he is a little concerned about how much they used Brian throughout the final 11 games of the season after he took over for Nick Polino. Right. Then you go out to left tackle. A Sim Richards is your guy. That's you're, you got to live and die by him because you don't have Tristan Miller, who you were hoping to have. He's opted out of the 2020 season. So now you've got to... You, you got some concerns here. Well, if Jordan Tucker's your best pass blocker, you could kick him to left. They've said no. They've said they will keep him at right no matter what. Even if there is an injury to Richards, they would move Izudu out to left tackle and uh, Jordan Tucker would stay at right tackle. So for That's some reason, you, you they, feel they, like they'd be willing to move him. If he's your best pass right. blocker, you want to you want to protect Sam's blind side. I guess maybe you got to wait and see he's on his backside 10, 12 times against Syracuse, and that makes you make the move? I Yeah, I mean, look, this team had had trouble a year ago protecting the quarterback. Yeah. I, I don't – I haven't gone back and watched – Game, you know, each game and seeing who you know is credited with allowing a lot of the sacks. Maybe there were more sacks that were allowed by Jordan Tucker than we originally realized. The other thing that's that I think could factor in there is maybe he's just better to his right side. Maybe he doesn't move as smoothly to his left. Maybe his, his right is the best area for him, and, and I'm fine with that. You know, Zudu's played left tackle last year. Now, I thought he struggled a little bit in that game against App State. He's going to have to elevate his play from there. But an ideal scenario, you wouldn't have to see that. But that's the other big thing about it. Not only are you trusting a guy in a Sim Richards who played sparingly last year. I think there's some things to like about him. Clearly, I mean, this this was a guy that we heard even before the COVID shutdown with everything that he'd been doing in the winter and everything that he showed the staff last offseason to earn the backup job. He was the guy. They were feeling confident right. in him. But you, uh, now you've kind of got no choice. But, I mean, you're talking about Max said two weeks ago, Joshua Zudu is your backup at both tackle spots. If one guy goes down, they have to kick him out. And what's going to happen is you would think that sixth guy that they're comfortable with playing is probably the guy that started at left guard for the early part of last season, the first seven games, and Ed Montillas, who's good. He had some moments where he struggled. I think he He's definitely a he struggled in pass protection. He's a pretty solid run blocker. Those are some areas that you got to get cleaned up with him. He's a nice backup, and that's a good guy to have. But apparently, outside of those guys, and maybe Ty Murray at center, you don't really have anybody yeah. that you're apparently that confident in. That's a little concerning to me. It's concerning to everybody. I mean, when, you're, when your head coach comes out and says, I want to have eight at the minimum, ten at the max, and right now i got six, that's, that's not good. And Mac's not going to say that. If if he if he didn't feel something that needed to be said like that was probably right. maybe a way to motivate the guys that are in there to you know hey, I need you to be better because I you know I want eight right now I got six but I mean there's just I, we've been harping on it you're going to need as much depth as as you've ever had because there are going to be stuff that's going to come up this year yep and right now. And the offensive line last year wasn't great. They probably cost Carolina a couple games, especially that Pittsburgh against we could not, you know, neutralize their front. If they can't do that, then you're not going to be able to run the ball as well. You're not going to be able to throw the ball as well. You're not going to win. Yeah, I mean, look, we talked about, you know, when the schedule came out, you know, you avoid Clemson, you avoid Louisville, you avoid Pittsburgh. 
that can get after the passer. You're still going to face teams like Miami. I know they don't have Gregory Russo. They still get after the quarterback. Yeah. That's one of the things that they're known to be able to do. You still got to face Chris Rumpf and Duke, who, I mean, this this guy, if he wasn't playing at Duke, he would be a first-round pick. Probably. That team's just, they, they don't Duke. get a much, a much attention because, frankly, they're not good. The rest of that team is not good around them, and but they that's don't care. but that's going to be a tough that that's going to be a tough matchup. We saw that last year; they were one of the teams that were able to get after Sam pretty well last year, and and almost found a way to win that game, if not for a miracle play. They did a better job taking us out of our comfort zone than Clemson did. Yeah, yeah, and I would not, agree. I'm with not that. saying that just to say that. I, I, I was at both games in person, and again, Clint, that does not mean that Duke is better than Clemson. Clemson had an off game. We had thought that when we did that breakdown last year. If you go all the way back to that podcast, we said that could be one of the games where they overlook us because we thought it'll be an early game. It was. It's in our place, and it's in the heart of their schedule where they could overlook an opponent. But you're right. I, I thought, and they've done that. Year in and year out recently. When David Cutcliffe's been there, they've done a really good job of doing that. But you're going to face those type of teams. You know, NC State, another team, We for years, they've been a defensive line factory. You've got to protect your quarterback or else you're not going to win. I know that we said, look, you know, we feel confident that Jace can come in there. I'm more confident in Jace than I was in Vincent Amendola a year ago. I will say that. That's no slight to Vincent. Jace, Jace Ruder can get you guy. to six and four. Jace Ruder is not Sam Howell. I don't want to be six and four. Yeah. And and the thing is, is if you lose him for games against Virginia Tech, you lose him. That was another team. They destroyed us, especially on the inside, yeah. getting after the passer. If you lose him for games like that, then you're in trouble. This offensive line has to be able to protect the quarterback, and they've got to be able to open running lanes for this team because if this team cannot run the football, they will not be as effective as they were a year ago. You cannot stand back unless you're going to turn this into a Mike Leach-style offense where Sam Howell is going to throw the ball 55, 60 times a game and reach the 350-yard mark every game. You're going to be in trouble. I don't want the offense to come to that, and we're not saying that. There are guys here that can get this offensive line in a good spot. I'm confident in McKeithen. I'm confident in Tucker. And I like what I've seen from Mizzoudu. Now in his full year as a starter, we'll see how that transitions over the whole year. I'm confident that he'll be fine if he stays at left guard. Yeah. And, you know, the other guys, I mean, you know, I was hoping Ty Murray would probably get a chance there because we've heard that, you know, when he got recruited, this is the guy. This is the future of the center position. He fits exactly what we want in our system in a center. Yeah. Anderson's probably your guy for this year. He showed last year he's serviceable enough. He just needs to be more consistent. Yeah, he's he's a serv- he, he's he's a backup. Uh, backup he, fringe, is, fringe is, starter. I think he can handle Carolina, the starting role. Carolina's got to be more dominant up front. Yeah. If they want to if they want to be seriously contending to beat Clemson, or for this year, we get, we get Notre Dame at the end of our schedule. Right. You if, can't have teams pin their ears back yeah. and just come after your quarterback. And, and last year, if, if you can't block Virginia and Pittsburgh, you, you ain't going to block the big boys that, yeah. that, that you want to, that we, we think we're, we're ready to play again. Right now, the offensive line probably isn't ready for that challenge. Well, the good news is, is that, of course, they have wait until later in the year to face most of those teams. The first big test I feel for them will probably be. Do they when do they, they play Boston College? I believe before they play Virginia. The October third, I believe, is that date. Right. So those th- that's going to be back to back weeks. Boston College, who is always a very good defensive team, they always have guys up front that can rush the passer. Followed by that game against Virginia Tech, against a team that whooped your tail on the inside last year. Their their big men on the interior just destroyed your your offensive guards. Right. They've got to be better. And if they are, great. If not, you could you could be in some trouble. Those those could be two games where you're going to learn a lot about your offensive line going forward. But uh, you know, finding that depth. I mean, there's guys there. Jonathan Adorno. We've heard you know he's a true freshman. Played a little bit of offensive tackle. He's always ta- he's also taken some reps at uh, center. Um, somebody told me Wyatt Tanall. He had to sit out all last year because he got injured uh, just prior to uh, spring camp. Uh, apparent or excuse me, fall camp. He was a uh, he was a summer enrollee. Uh, missed the whole season. They said he's taking some reps at tackle, also taking some reps at uh, at center. So what it tells me is that they feel confident in the guys they have at offensive guard. 
Because you got Montillas. You also got a, an extremely talented guy that we've been waiting to see break out in William Barnes. You know, this was a guy that a couple of years ago was the highest rated prospect the Tar Heels landed in his class. Right. And he just hasn't really taken off. I feel like they're confident in the interior play. They got to sear up they, the edges. They got to find guys at those tackle spots. Losing Tristan Miller was so huge for them because you thought, I mean, former four star guy coming in, last year red shirted. He was putting on a little more weight, but unfortunately, he's lost his brother to COVID 19. So it's understandable why he's sitting out and, you know, trying to get through what's an extremely tough time for him and his family. But I think, you know, that, that does leave you in a little bit of a position where you've got to have other guys that step up. Yeah, so, no doubt. Uh, you know, yeah, you look at this offense, I still feel, you know, there's there that we wrapped up with some some somber notes, but I feel like overall we feel like this offense is still gonna be very good. I this think this year. offense is gonna take a step forward. I think they'll average forty points a game. I think Sam Havel will put up Heisman like contending numbers. I think they're gonna be everything that we want them to be in year two. I think you'll see better play calling from Phil Longo. I think they'll be better in the red zone. I think they'll be more home run threats. I think they're going to be fun to watch. Oh, for sure. I, I think that, you know, this will be a team that week in and week out for the first time in years, we're going to hear talked about and talked about a lot, not only because they have to on college game day, because yeah. this team's going to be exciting. Not like 15 where they were pretty much like, well, we got to talk about them. They were forced. Yeah. Yeah. We, we don't want to. But now they're going to be really invested in, in following this team, and a big part of that is because of the offense. So, uh, of course, if you guys want to be able to uh, go a little more in-depth on these guys, you know, we talked about a lot of the guys, but look, you know, we mentioned Jacoby Criswell. He's got backup Jefferson Boaz at running back, all those guys that we mentioned. Well, we've got all, all, even more in-depth looks at what they can bring to the table this year on the website. Go to HeelToughBlog.com. We've got all of those full position previews online right now, all for the offense. You can check out the quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, tight ends, offensive line, and if you want to start getting prepared for next week, the defensive line is already up there. Linebackers is coming out uh, tonight, as well as the defensive backs coming out tomorrow, and then we will release our final one, the special teams unit, before we head into full preseason mode, because believe it or not, that Syracuse game is not that far away. September 12th is coming pretty quickly. Uh, also, make sure that you guys check out on the website the 2022 targets, narrowing down their recruitments. Uh, we got some really big targets that narrow down uh, their recruitments here in recent days. Uh, you got Benji Gosnell, the four-star tight end from up in Pilot Mountain, North Carolina at East Surrey High School. That's the brother of Steven. He actually released the top three. And then the top three players in the state of North Carolina – Five-star defensive tackle Travis Shaw, four-star outside linebacker Jalen Walker, and four-star wide receiver Shalik Knotts all announced that they will release something big, either a top schools list or Shalik Knotts just said something big. That can mean a commitment here in the coming days. So the 2022 class, I think as a lot of the 2021 guys are starting to realize, they're not going to be able to get on campus this year for normal visits that they take during the season. They might have to start moving their recruiting process along a little bit quicker and just going off of what they know relationship-wise and what they've known from pre previous visits uh, to the school. So you guys can check that out on there. Also, make sure you go back, read that scouting report for Eli Sutton, the Tar Heels 2021 four-star offensive tackle commit. This coming week, we're going uh, to scout another player from the state of Tennessee. It is going to be 2022 four-star offensive tackle Fisher Anderson. Uh, make sure you guys keep an eye on the uh, website for that. Uh, also, make sure you like and follow the Facebook page. That's a new thing we're going to ask you guys to do since we're on video, so you don't miss an episode of the show. So, uh, we're you know some sometimes during the season we'll end up doing live shows. Other times they'll be pre-recorded like this one. But at the same time, we want you guys to make sure that you catch whenever these editions come out. We want you guys to go ahead, leave questions in there. I'm going to have the video pulled up whenever I have it playing. So if you guys have any questions. We can always answer those questions for you guys. If it's a live show, of course, we'll answer them right on camera for you guys as well. We'll be doing a few of those throughout the year. Also, if you're on the podcast platform, if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Spreaker, anywhere that you listen to your podcast, make sure that you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast whenever you listen. We would greatly appreciate that. So We want to thank everyone for watching and those for listening. And as always, Go Tar Heels! Thank you